So our next topic is boosting. And boosting is, is a relatively new method as well. And similar to bagging in random forest, it builds, it gives prediction models that are averages of, over trees. Um, but there's a fundamental difference. Random forest and bagging, the trees that are averaged are all um, equivalent, and the averaging is, is just used to reduce variance. With boosting, it's a sequential method. And each of the trees that's, that's added into the mix is added to improve on the performance of the, of the previous collection of trees. So that's a fundamental difference. We'll look at first boosting for our regression trees. Um, it's simpler to explain there. And we just think of it as a sequential algorithm. And the bottom line is, with boosting, what we do is we keep on fitting trees to the residuals, and so we improve the fit. And, and so we can describe that very um, easily here. We start off, and we're trying to build a function f of x, um, which is going to be an average of trees. And this is, in the, this is evaluated at some point x, so we think of it as a function. It'll start off with 0, and the residuals will just be the data observations yi. Um, and what we're going to do is sequentially, going from B, going from 1 up to capital B, we'll just keep on going, um, we're going to fit a tree um, with D splits, in other words, D plus 1 terminal nodes, to the training data X and R, where R is the current residual. Initially, the residuals are just the observations. Okay, so we build a relatively small tree to the residuals, and then we're going to update the function by adding that tree into our current model. So our current model starts off at zero, and now repeatedly we're going to add in the tree that we've just grown. And when we add it in, we actually shrink it down by a factor lambda. So there's these two components, growing a tree to the residuals, and then adding in some shrunken version of it into your current model. And that lambda is pretty small, right? It's like we're going to see about 0 0.01, for example, as a value of lambda. So really shrinking yeah. it down, OK? And then, of course, you update the residuals, because the residuals will change by a corresponding amount. And so you keep on doing that. Grow tree to the residuals, add it into your function, downdate the residu residuals, and continue. And you can see at the end of the day, your model, your boosted model, has this form. It's a sum of shrunken trees, um, all B of them, grown to the data. Now, these trees are not independent of each other like they were in random forest and boosting, because each tree was grown to the residuals left over from the previous collection of trees. OK, so what's, what's the idea behind this procedure? Well, uh, for, for a single tree, we, we, we can fit a large tree to the data. And if you fit the data hard with a large tree, we, we can overfit. So in contrast, the, the, the idea of boosting is to learn more slowly. So we start with y. We build a tree to y. And it can, it can sometimes be a small tree. But, but, but rather than accept the full tree, we shrink it back but by a lot, uh, by, for example, a factor of 0.01. And then we take residuals and repeat. So that the idea being that instead of to avoid overfitting, we're going to fit very slowly and try to, at, at each stage, try to pick up a small piece of the signal with the next tree. So instead of trying to, trying to grab a lot of signal with, with, over, with, with a large amount of fitting, we're going to, it fits very slowly in, sm in small parts, shrinking each time in order to, um, uh, to uh, approximate the signal uh, without overfitting. And it, it, as a, a nice uh, c consequence is we don't actually have to grow very large trees, as we did in, in random forest. Quite often, smaller trees fit in this slow, sequential uh, manner will be very effective. Boosting also works for classification. Um, and it's similar in spirit, um, but it's slightly more complex. So we're not going to go in detail here. But, um, and, and, and in fact, we don't go into more detail in the textbook. But um, there's, a, there's a detailed section in, in, in our other textbook, Elements of Statistical Learning, in chapter 10. And, and you can learn about how uh, boosting works for classification. It doesn't stop you using boosting for classification. There's the R package GBM, which we use in the exercises and, and the examples, and we'll use in the R session. And that handles a variety of regression and, and classification problems. OK, so let's see, see the results of boosting for the gene expression data. Um, this, these are test errors. The orange curve is, is, is boosting depth one. So what that means is actually each tree's got a single split, sometimes called a stump. Right? So a very, very simple tree. Uh, which 
again, it might seem a little crazy, but we're going to use 5,000 uh, 5, of them. And when they're used in this, in this, uh, this uh, sequential, slow-fitting way, um, it actually does quite well. The error is about, what's, about 7 or 8 percent. Random forests, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, random forests are a little higher here. They're about 12 or 13 percent. Um, using uh, a depth 2 tree, which means two splits, we do maybe a little worse than the simple stump model. So again, it's, it's quite striking that a very, very simple model applied in a slow and sequential way, at, at the end of it, we get a, an ensemble that actually predicts very well. So Rob, it seems like the depth of the tree that you're using boosting becomes a tuning parameter. Exactly. Well, thank you for the lead into the next slide, which is um, the, the tuning parameters. So there's a bunch of tuning parameters. Trevor did just mentioned one, the depth. Actually, let me just put them all up. So, uh, well, the, the, uh, the third one here I've written is what Trevor just mentioned, that the, the number of splits of the tree uh, is a tuning parameter. Uh, the, the depth, it's called, sometimes called D, is, uh, if D is one, it's simply a stump, which we saw was successful in the previous example. Um, and if we, D is larger, it allows it the interaction between predictors. So typically, one tries a few values of D, maybe D equals one, two, four, and eight. That might be a typical example, depending on on the size of your data set and the number of predictors. Oh, so if, yeah. if D is one, each little tree can only involve a single variable. Right, so it's, it's actually an, an additive function of, of single variables, so there's no interactions allowed. And if D equals two, it can involve at most two variables. Right, so that's pairwise interactions. So, yeah. Interesting. So uh, that's one tuning parameter. Uh, the number of trees is also a tuning parameter. Unlike in yeah. random forests where the number of trees you just went far enough so right. that you, uh, till you stopped right. uh, getting the benefit of averaging. Right. I think it's still the case that, that the number of trees is not a hugely important parameter. It's possible to overfit, but it takes, I think, a very large number to typically start to cause overfitting. And here we see we're out to 5,000, and uh, not much is really happening yet in terms of overfitting. I think it's, it especially depends on the yeah. problem. Yeah. Um, in some problems, you'll see the curves really going up. But right. with classification problems, it often just levels out like that. So the other one is the, the, the shrinkage parameter. Remember, every time we, we grow a tree, we don't accept the full tree. Rather, we shrink it back by a quite small fraction. Uh, and typically, 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 are the choices one uses. So there's the, these three tuning parameters, one can just try a few values of each one and, um, and look at the cross-validation error for, over, the, over the grid to choose good sets of parameters. Here's a, so I have a couple more examples here from actually from our, 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 our earlier data mining book. This is the California housing data um, looking at the housing prices. And we have the, uh, the test error here as a function of number of trees for a number of methods we've talked about. Uh, random forests, m equals 2. I have to remember how many variables there are. We'll have to look in, our, in chapter 10 of, uh, 15 of our book to to uh, check that, but the uh, using um, random forest with only two variables allowed at each split gives you an error of about you know 0.39. Random forest with with more splits improves things a bit. A bit. Uh, GBM gradient boosting machine. This is this, the R package that that does that does boosting. It's uh, we'll see in the lab uh, with depth four and eight trees is are doing somewhat better. Looks like. It looks like they're still on their way down as well. Exactly. So maybe in this example, one should have run even more trees. Uh, another example, this is the spam data from our the earlier book, Chapter 15. This is, again, a two-class problem with about 50 predictors. Um, what do we have here? Well, let's first, another case where a single tree is really not very good, right? We've even, we've even truncated the scale here because it's, they're going out somewhere above 7%, single tree. Bagging. As we bag, we level off at around 5.5%. Random forests, probably using the, uh, the, um, the, the default of the square root of p as the number of predictors to select at every node has an error. It reduces that by, uh, the scale is pretty compressed, half a percent. Uh, and then boosting five node trees gets another maybe half percent. So these two methods are quite good. And they're, you know, I think we've seen a lot of examples. They're pretty comparable when you say in performance. Yeah. Those look like they might be, you know, quite two different curves, but actually, if you do the proper statistical test, they they are not significantly different. Okay, uh, this actually last topic, 
variable, the, 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 the importance of variables, how do you measure the importance of variables in trees and bagging and boosting and, um, and random forests? Well, um, there's, no single, there's no single parameter, no coefficient with the standard error you can, you can refer to because trees use variables in multiple places, right? At every time you split, a, a variable could, could uh, participate in the split. So what's done in, uh, in, in bagging random forests is, is we, um, one, one records the, uh, the, the total drop in RSS uh, for a given predictor over all splits in the tree. So if it, it, we look at all the possible splits, we, we look to see whether the variable was involved in that split. If it was, we, we, we measure how much it dropped the, the RSS, and that's averaged over all the trees. So the higher, the better. And um, a similar thing with, with, with GNI index for classification trees. So what you get is a, essentially a, a qualitative ranking. Um, this is the, the variable importance for the heart data, and you can see the, the thallium stress test is at a variable importance of 100. It, things are usually normalized so that the top variable has 100. And you can see the other variables are indicated here in terms of their importance, from calcium down to variables with lower importance. So these variable importance plots are, 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 are quite an important part of the random forest uh, toolkit, also used in boosting. The same plot is used in boosting. So to summarize, uh, we've talked about decision trees and, and using ensembles of trees. Um, the, on the plus side, you know, they're, they're simple and interpretable when they're small. But as we've seen the, the, in the examples we've seen and other examples, that they're often not very competitive in terms of prediction error. So some, some newer methods, bagging, random forest, and boosting, use, these, use trees in combination as an ensemble. And in the process, they, they can prove prediction error quite considerably. Um, and the result is that these, the, the, the last two methods we talked about, random forest and boosting, are really uh, among, uh, among the state-of-the-art techniques for supervised learning. Um, so if you're interested in prediction and really just prediction performance, they're very good techniques. For interpretation, as we've seen, they're, they're, they're more challenging.